So today we're going to talk about Harry Frankfurt, who I believe is still alive, and his paper Freedom of the Will and the Concept of a Person. Frankfurt um, made his name with back-to-back -back amazing papers. In 1969, he wrote uh, one on alternate personality, uh, possibilities and freedom. And then he wrote this one that was published in 1971. And what this is, is it's a compatibilist theory of moral responsibility. OK, so a little bit of background. The big debate that has been going on for um, hundreds and hundreds of years in the philosophy of free will is the apparent conflict behind, between determinism <coughs> and free will. Determinism is the idea that the universe follows rigid laws such that um, everything that happens is had to happen um, according to the laws of the universe. Now, this appears to be implied by the success of modern science. Um, you know, recently NASA collided a spacecraft with an asteroid, which, as I always say, is like shooting a bullet and hitting another bullet in flight, uh, except more complicated because you fire the bullet years in advance. So you have to know you have to know that your spacecraft and this asteroid are going to intersect at some time in the future. Uh, how on earth are you going to get that right? Um, and the answer is because you know how this asteroid is going to behave, you know how the, the rocket is going to behave, because you understand gravity and you understand the effects that, uh, that planets are going to have on both of these things, and you can, you know, do the math and you'll be right. And it turns out they were right. They managed to get the spacecraft to crash into the asteroid as a dry run in case an asteroid comes towards us and we want to knock it off course. So that's just an illustration of how the universe obeys rigid laws so that it's predictable. OK, so what? This is a good thing, right? Well, but remember, we are made of the same stuff that asteroids are made of. We're all made of the same ancient uh, particles that have been around since the dawn of the universe. And just as an asteroid, the particles that make up an asteroid has to obey the rigid laws of the universe, so, so do we. So it looks like um, at every point uh, in our lives, what we do could have been predicted by somebody who knew all of the particles that make us up and the laws of the universe. Um, so it looks like everything we do, we had to do. We couldn't do otherwise. We could not have done otherwise. And so what? Well, if you think that freedom in, uh, or the, the kind of freedom that matters requires the possibility of doing other than what you in fact did, then we're not free. OK, so people who believe that the kind of freedom that matters requires that you should, have been, should be able to do otherwise, and also that determinism rules this out, are called incompatibilists, because they say that determinism and freedom are incompatible. You can't have both. Uh, and they fall into two camps. The libertarians say determinism and free will are incompatible. We are free, so determinism is not universally true. You know, libertarians don't say that asteroids behave randomly. They say that there's some, uh, they say that yes, the behavior of asteroids and things like that is determined. It follows rigid laws. But humans are special cases. There's something about us. Some libertarians believe that we have a soul. For example, Descartes thought this. He thought that uh, our material bodies follow the rigid laws of the universe, but we have immaterial souls that are completely free and not determined by the, the laws of the universe. Uh, modern libertarians don't believe in souls. They believe that there's something special about the, our brains. Or they try to bring up the fact that quantum mechanics allows um, you know, indeterminism in some respects. And they try to work that into a theory of free will. Uh, so the libertarians say, um, if determinism were true about us, we wouldn't be free. But it's not true about us, so we are free. Uh, this libertarian is not meant in the same 
way as the political sense, like the, the Paul family, Ron and Rand, are supposed to be libertarians. That, that, that's a different kind of libertarianism. This is called, called metaphysical libertarianism. Okay, the hard determinists, meanwhile, as you can imagine, say that yes, determinism and free will are incompatible. Determinism is true of us, so therefore we're not free. Uh, and of course, they have to explain, well, then why do we punish people if they're not free? Because there is this um, apparent connection, very close-knit connection, between being free, having free will, and being moral, morally responsible for anything. If, on the, uh, you know, if a robot does something wrong, it would be stupid to punish the robot. Why? Because the robot couldn't choose to do what it did and is therefore not responsible. But if determinism is true, in some sense where the universe is robots, we are programmed to do what we do and punishing us would be equally silly. So hard determinists have to explain, well, okay, you think we're not free. That undercuts our self-image to a massive degree. It means that praise and blame are pointless and things like that. Okay, so those are the incompatibilists. Well, what is compatibilism? Compatibilism says that, in fact, determinism is compatible with free will. You can have both. We can be fully determined so that at every moment our, our actions are the predictable res, uh, result of what the universe is made of and the rules that the universe follows, such that we could only ever do one thing at any point in our lives. And yet, we can still be said to be free. So clearly, compatibilists deny that uh, you need this to be free because determinism appears to rule out that uh, at any moment we have alternative possibilities. Um, there's only one thing we can do at any moment. So a compatibilist has to say that you don't need this. Frankfurt's earlier paper, Alternate Possibilities, uh, he refers to it right near the end in a footnote. Um, uh, yes, on page 19, he says, uh, alternate possibilities and moral responsibility. In this earlier paper, he gives a very famous case um, arguing that, in fact, you can be morally responsible. So he sort of teases apart freedom of the will and moral responsibility. And he says, all right, maybe freedom of the will requires that you could have done otherwise. I don't know. I'm not going to wade into that debate. But he says, but moral responsibility, which is normally taken to be tied up with freedom of the will, so that where you've got one, you've got the other, and where you don't have one, you don't have the other. He says moral responsibility is actually separate from this. And moral responsibility does not require that you could have done otherwise. He calls this the principle of alternate possibilities. That is, you're only morally responsible if you could have done otherwise. He says that's false. And he gives a famous case that I'll give a version of here. Imagine that uh, you and the evil neuroscientist Mr. Black both want a third party dead. Call him Mr. Pink. All right, so both of you hate Mr. Pink. But Mr. Black doesn't want to get his hands dirty. He wants Mr. Pink dead, but he doesn't want to be the one that kills Mr. Pink. Now, he happens to know that you want to kill Mr. Pink, so he's kind of hoping that you will do it for him. But to make sure that you do, he breaks into your bedroom one night and implants in your brain a chip. Now, the chip lies dormant until such a time when you are considering killing Mr. Pink. And if you decide not to kill Mr. Pink, then the chip will activate and make you kill Mr. Pink. So consequently, what the presence of this chip in your brain means is that you don't have a choice. You have to kill Mr. Pink. Either you will decide to do it and kill him, in which case the chip never activates, or you will decide not to kill him, in which case the chip activates and you will kill him. So either way, no matter what you choose, you're going to end up killing Mr. Pink. As it happens, you decide to kill Mr. Pink and you do. So the chip never activates. In that instance, did you, did, should you be held morally responsible for killing Mr. Pink? And 
I think most people say, yes, you should, because you did what you wanted, you decided to kill Mr. Pink, and you did it in some sense of your own free will. So you should be held morally responsible. So, and Frankfurt thinks you will agree with this, and most people do. And what Frankfurt says that shows is that you can be morally responsible even if it's not true that you could have done otherwise. Because in this case, it's not true that you could have done otherwise, so, uh, and yet you're morally responsible. So that's what he does in that earlier paper, and that's uh, part of his compatibilism. It shows that you can have moral responsibility even if determinism is true, and even if it's not true that you could have done otherwise. Something of a similar point is being made with his third addict case, which happens late in the paper. We talk about these two cases early on in the paper. This one is in the last section. And it's making a very similar point to the Mr. Black case. So I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so that's the background. Um, Frankfurt is laying out his compatibilist view. Okay, though, if you're going to be a compatibilist and you're going to say um, that, that in some sense freedom and uh, certainly moral responsibility doesn't require choices, well then, what's the difference between acting freely and not acting freely? What is it to be uh, a free person and what is it not to be free? So, Classic compatibilism says, uh, classic compatibilism also rejects this. It says, classic compatibilism dates back to, uh, for some reason, British people and um, uh, British people seem to be fond of compatibilism. I don't know, it works for me. Um, so uh, Locke, actually, John Locke, um, was one of the first people to give a compatibilist example. And in fact, his example is very similar to the Mr. Black ex example. Uh, John Locke says, uh, imagine someone in a dungeon, unknown to him, he's locked in. But he wants to be there. He's sitting there, he's chatting to someone, he wants to be there. Is he there of his own free will? John Locke says yes, even though he can't get out. Even though he can't do otherwise, he's still of his own free will. So that's the, basically the same idea as the Mr. Black case. So, so long as you are doing what you want, you are free. So the classic compatibilist notion of, of acting freely is to do what you want. Now, uh, we see this referred to in the Frankfurt article where he talks about freedom of action. Freedom of action is doing what you want. Now, is that enough? Uh, and uh, the incompatibilists, or certainly the libertarians, say, no, that's not enough. It's not enough to be uh, free that you just do what you want. And actually, um, although he's a compatibilist, Frankfurt agrees. He says, basically, that's what animals do. Animals just do what they want. And sure, we, we, in some sense, they act freely, but they don't act freely in the way that is required for moral responsibility, because we don't hold animals morally responsible for what they do. We think they just act on instinct. So you can say uh, a cow is wandering freely, so in some sense you're using the word free, but it's not freedom in this valuable sense that makes them moral agents. It, uh, in other words, animals are not persons. Okay, so here we see uh, Frankfurt used the term person in a morally loaded way. Uh, we've looked at the, uh, we've discussed personal identity, and there we use the term person, uh, which dates, which traces back to Locke, and we say a person is someone who is self-conscious. Okay, now the reason um, Locke defines it in that way is because he thinks that's connected with what's special about humans, and uh, what's special about humans as well is that we can be held morally responsible, whereas non-human animals can't. So right from the start, this, uh, from when we see it in Locke, this notion of a person is, comes with moral weight. If you are a person, you are in some sense capable of moral action and capable of being assessed morally. You can be moral, you can be immoral. 
animals or non-human animals aren't capable of that. My cat can be a shit sometimes, but I wouldn't say they're acting immorally because they're not capable of acting immorally. You know, when they go along, and it, it, certainly it looks like they, they, they you know, make eye contact and then they knock your mug off the table. It looks like they're intentionally doing something, but most people would say, no, they don't have the capabilities. They're not persons. Now, in this article, um, Frankfurt sort of discusses, is a person, does it just mean a human? And, he, and then he says, no, persons could be non-humans in, in theory. You could have aliens that are persons. So person isn't tied to biological species and shouldn't be defined as such. Person should be defined in terms of capacities. Now, uh, so what is a person? I mean, the title of the article says the concept of a person. Well, he says, he says, uh, I think that the notion of a person is tied up with the structure of a person's will. Um, so it's something to do with how people make decisions. It's something to do with how creatures make decisions determines whether or not they're persons. Okay, this is where he starts talking about desires. And he starts talking about, you know, what it is to want something. And this can be a little bit confusing. So he says, he, gi uh, he gives a discussion of wanting something and he gives a list of possibilities. This is in section one, which starts on page seven. Uh, and he says, to say A, a person A wants to do X, action X, is consistent with a whole bunch of things, including that person not wanting to do that. Um, how can that be? How can somebody want something at the same time as, how can that be consistent with them not wanting something? Answer, because he has this view of, you have all of these desires inside you. And um, you can have conflicting desires. And of course we're familiar with this, you know, you can say, I'm of two minds. Like, if you're on a diet, you want the donut, but also you don't want the donut because you want to lose weight. So you can have conflicting desires. Now, uh, he also makes this distinction between first order and second order desires. And this is very important. This is the core of his compatibilism, is this distinction. First order desires are desires to act. So if I, have, if I desire, if I want to X, and X is an action, that's a first order desire. So I want to eat the donut, that's a first order desire. All right, what's the second order desire? It's like a meta desire. Second order is a desire on top of the first one. It's a desire about the first one. So uh, when uh, you have a desire that can be expressed as A wants X, where X is a desire rather than action. So in first order, A wants X means X is an action. That's, you have a first order desire if you want to do an action. You have a second order desire if you want, and the subject of that desire is a desire. So you want to want something. Um, as people like to, uh, like to point out, there's a Cheap Trick song. Do people remember Cheap Trick called I Want You to Want Me? So that's uh, saying that I have a desire about your desires. Well, second order desires are to have a desire about your own desires. I want, I wish I was the kind of person who wanted to go running. I often think that. I, I do not want to go running. I wish I was the kind of person that did want to go running. It seems like the worst thing in the world and I just think of my knees hurting. But it would be nice, you know, I'd be in better shape. It would be good for me if I went running. So that's the second order desire. I want to have the desire to. Now, a um, couple more distinctions. Uh, you can have first order desires because you have all of these desires and they're all sort of, uh, you know, some of them are successful, they're stronger or weaker and they're pushing in different directions. You have sort of this, you know, maelstrom going on inside you of all these desires pushing you in various directions. If the uh, desire wins out, in this sort of fight of desires. It's strong enough and it's not opposed by enough uh, other desires to cancel it out. 
it will cause you to act. So, um, so for example, if you act and somebody said, why did you do that? And you said, well, I wanted to. You're pointing to a desire that wasn't effective because it was the thing that caused you to do that action. So, the winning desires are effective desires. And uh, this notion will, I mean, people talk about free will or freedom of the will um, all the time. What is this thing will? What does it mean? You know, he did it of his own free will. What is the will there? Well, different philosophers through the years have come up with different things. Most famously, the philosopher Kant, who talks of your will as if it's this kind of undetermined, uh, he says the, the will shines forth like a diamond or something like that. It's, it's the most important thing about, about persons is that they have this entirely undetermined, uh, Kant was a libertarian, undetermined uh, thing within you that is sort of a decision-making capacity. Kant very much did not define will in terms of desires. Frankfurt has a much more kind of down-to-earth, um, I don't know, you might say it seems more scientific. It seems more consistent with modern views about humans and with uh, psychology. And it's this idea that our will is simply whatever desire was effective. So the will changes depending on your action. So if I say, you know, why did you eat that donut? Because I was hungry. Uh, I desired something to satiate my hunger. Well, that desire was my will in that particular instance. But it won't be my will in other instances. It won't be what causes me to you know, read an article uh, later that evening because I want to be prepared for tomorrow's class. That wasn't caused by the same desire. So your will is just, it can be a different desire at every moment of your day. It's not a constant thing. It's just, and it's just a desire. And we know what desires are. The desires aren't these strange, undetermined things like the Kantian kind of will. They're very, we're very familiar with the concept of desire. We've used the, the, the language of desire probably since English was invented. Um, so that's what he says a will is. So now we need to know, well, what is it to have a free will? Okay, um, well, we're, we're going to get back, to, we're going to get to that. But now uh, let's look at second order again. So second order desires are desires about desires. Now he says you can have different kinds of second order desires, and he's only interested in one of them. The one that he's not interested in, he actually comes up with an interesting example to illustrate. And he says, uh, this is the example of the doctor, the physician, who's treating drug addicts. All of his examples are drug addicts. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, I don't think he was a drug addict. Um, it, was the, it was the 60s turning into the 70s. Drugs were in the air, I guess. Okay, so you're a physician who's treating drug addicts. And... In order to understand your patients, you want to know what they're going through. You want to know what it's like to have the intense desire that they appear to have to take drugs. So this physician has a desire to feel the desire to take a drug. Um, so in some sense, this desire is about the content of a desire. You want to have a certain desire. And notice you don't actually have this desire yet. You don't, have a, the, you don't have the desire to take the drug because the physician is not addicted, has never taken drugs. So they don't actually have the first order desire to take the drugs. They want to have that desire. But notice what they don't want is for that desire to actually motivate them to act. And they don't want, they don't want uh, so in some sense, they're sort of conflicted. They want the desire to have the drug. They want to know what that's like. They want to feel that desire. But they certainly don't want that desire to win out. They don't want that desire to become their will, to become an effective desire that drives them to action. 
So they have a desire about the content of their desire, but they don't have a desire about that desire becoming an effective one. But that second kind of desire, uh, second order desire, a desire, it's not a desire about the content of a desire, it's desire, a desire about what that first order desire will do. It's, it's a desire that that first order desire be successful. So the, the first kind is a desire to have a certain kind of desire, whereas the second one is a, is a desire that a desire that you already have. So in the first case, you don't have this desire. You don't have a desire to take a drug. You want that desire to come into existence. In the second one, you're having a desire about a first order desire that you already have, that it be effective. So for example, you know, imagine I've, I'm trying to finish an article and, uh, you know, I have all these conflicting desires. I, I have a desire to just surf the internet. I have a desire to go for a walk. I have a desire to watch TV. But my second order desire is I want my desire to sit down and write that freaking article to win. I want that to be the one that uh, wins out. I don't want it to be the desire to just watch TV that wins out because later on I know I'll feel crappy about myself. So I want the desire to sit down and write to be effective. That is a second order desire that he calls a volition. A volition, a second order volition, is a desire that, a first order desire that I already have, be my will, be the kind of desire that is effective. Okay, so now we've determined, we've defined a volition. This is a, another old term uh, we talk about of my own volition. So what, uh, what Frankfurt is doing is he's taking a lot of already existing terminology, person, will, volition, all of these terms have been used before, and he's saying, I'm going to give you nice, clean, precise, simple definitions of these contested terms, these terms that people have argued about for forever. I'm going to take, so it's not as if, he's not inventing these terms, these words. These words have been in the air, and they've been used for roughly, in roughly this context. Like a person is someone who has more, is a creature that has moral value. Will is something to do with uh, acting freely. Volition is something to do with acting freely. He says, I'm going to take these words and I'm going to give them my own spin that has advantages of, that he, he actually lists later on in the article, the advantages of his view. So don't think that he's inventing these words. These words are in the air. Including wanton. A wanton, we also use this word, like there was wanton destruction. Um, it seems like uh, it's used in a way that means kind of random and unmotivated. But he actually uses the term um, to mean somebody or something or an animal or a creature or, a, or even a human. He says it's rare in humans. I, I think it's not actually that rare. They're a being that doesn't have second order volitions. They can actually have some second order desire. So a wanton can have the first kind of sec, uh, second order desire. But what they don't have is they don't have desires that their desires affect them. And, and why is this important? Why does he think that having volitions is what makes a person? Because that's what he says. A person is someone who has uh, volitions, the sec uh, particular kinds of second order desires. A wanton doesn't. Person versus wanton. They can, so notice per wantons can be free in the classic compatibilist sense because they have first order desires. Animals, all animals are wantons. As he says, small children are wantons. So what is it that's valuable about volitions? Think about what it is to be somebody who is in control of their actions. You all know, you all know people or children who if you ask them, you know, they do something. Like I, there was an early Simpsons episode um, where Bart is just, uh, he's got, 
you know, the, the free packets of ketchup you get with a burger. And he's just got a bunch of those and he's laid them out on the floor and he's just hitting them with hammers so that they explode, singing Jingle Bells. And, you know, Marge says, what are you doing? And it's like, I don't know. Uh, and that's what kids are like. They just do things. They don't think about doing things. They, there is no sense. They allow their desires to just pull them wherever they will. And they don't, they don't care. You know, it's just, I'm doing what I want. It's just sort of drift. In some sense, they're not in control. They're just adrift in a sea of desires that just ha they happen to have. It's not as if they're the desires that they chose. Whereas, if you have second order desires uh, uh, about which desires you want to be the ones that cause you to do things, in some sense you're in control. You're, um, you're classifying and uh, organizing the forces that push you to do things. And you have views about it. Uh, you have the views, I want to be the kind of person that does this, so I want to want to do that. You are reflective. All of these features are part of what makes you a moral agent, part of what makes you somebody capable of action, capable of responsibility. It's desires about what, uh, which of your desires cause you to act. I want to want to be a good person. I want to want to go running. I want to want to uh, you know, be a true friend. These kinds of things. So having this, you, you are reflective. You, you sit, in some sense, you sit back and look at your life and say, well, what do I want for my life? All of these features, as I say, are what makes you a person. And the kind of beings that don't do that, that just allow themselves to, you know, smash ketchup patch, packets because why not? They're wantons. So if, some, if you ask somebody why they did that and they say, oh, um, that's a sign that they're a wanton. And to illustrate the difference between a person and a wanton, he gives the addicts, these two addicts cases on page 12. Um, the unwilling addict is a person who is not free. Okay, so first of all, you have the wanton. Both of them are not really free. Why are they not really free? Because to be free is this. To act freely, this is uh, um, Frankfurt's analysis of what, free act, uh, what freedom entails. It is that your volition be effective and cause the desire that you want, that cause the first order desire that you want to win out, to actually win out. So when you act freely, it's that the first order desire that is your will, the one that is effective, that actually causes you to act, is the one that your volition wanted to be the will. So your second order desire is satisfied because the first order desire that it wanted to be your motivating force actually was successful. So that's why the unwilling addict is not free. The unwilling addict is a person, so the unwilling addict is capable of free will. It's only when you're a person that you are capable either of um, acting of your own free will or of acting against your will. Because um, the will, in some sense, acting against your will, that actually, you know, Frankfurt, it seems like, couldn't really say that because your will is whatever is effective. So what he means is, uh, if you're acting against your will, it's that your, uh, the desire that actually ends up being your will is not the one that your volition cho chose. And that's what happens with the unwilling addict. The unwilling addict has an addiction, and wants to fight it, doesn't want to take drugs, wants to go clean, but keeps slipping, keeps relapsing because the desire to take the drugs is just so strong. So the unwilling addict is a person because they have volitions. They have a desire um, not to take the drug. They have a desire not, a desire, they have a second order desire 
that their desire to take the drug not win. Sadly, it does win, so they don't act freely, but they're, they're a person anyway. The wanton addict doesn't have a desire about his desires, so he just takes the drug and that's what he does, you know, he doesn't, it's not as if he feels bad about it. Um, so in some sense, you, you might say it's, it's better to be the wanton addict because he's not internally conflicted. He's not suffering, you know, this torment. Oh, God, I slipped again. Uh, the wanton just, you know, do, 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 takes his drugs and he's okay. But what he doesn't have is personhood. He is not a moral agent. He's just, uh, he's just kind of a thing that is moved by the winds of his, um, of his desires. Yeah, uh, on page 13 is where he talks about the unwilling addict uh, acting against his will. The force moving him to take the drug is a force other than his own. Of course, in one sense it is his own because it's one of his desires, but it's not the one that he picked out. The, the, it's not the, the favored horse in the horse race. Uh, and that it is not of his own free will, but rather against his will, that this force moves him to take it. Yeah, and of course, as I said, that's an odd thing for uh, Frankfurt to say, given how he's defined will as whatever desire it is that wins out. But um, what he means is it's not the one that he wants to will out. Okay, so there we move on to section three on page 14, where he gives this explicit definition of freedom of the will. It is only because a person has volitions uh, of the second order that he is capable both of enjoying and, in the case of the unwilling addict, lacking freedom of the will. All right, well, what is, what is freedom of the will? Well, he says, let's distinguish freedom of the will from this familiar notion, freedom of action. And he says, uh, freedom of action is the classic compatibilist freedom that uh, he has now said is not good enough. He's agreeing with the libertarian critics of classic compatibilism. It's not good enough simply to do what you want. Um, but because that's what freedom of action is. He says it's uh, freedom to do what you want. He says it's not sufficient for true, freedom of action is not sufficient for true freedom of the will because he says animals have freedom of action and we don't think they have free will. They just do what they want. So they have this, but they don't have this. So this doesn't guarantee you this. It's not sufficient for that. But furthermore, having freedom of action is not even necessary. Freedom of action is doing what you want. You have free action. So you, in other words, you can not have free action if you are put... You know, you want to go out and play, and you're in a locked room. Uh, you don't get to do what you want. But you can, even in those situations, you can have freedom of the will, as he says, for to deprive someone of his freedom of action is not necessarily to undermine the freedom of his will. When an agent, that's somebody uh, who acts, is aware that there are certain things he is not free to do, that his freedom of action is limited, this doubtless affects his desires and limits the range of subjects, uh, choices he can make. But suppose that someone without being aware of it has in fact lost or been deprived of his freedom of action. Even though he is no longer free to do what he wants to do, his will may remain as free as before. That sounds, of course, like Locke's example. Uh, so freedom of action, you can define this on page um, 15 as the freedom to do what one wants to do action, what one wants to do. Uh, freedom of the will is freedom to want what you want to want. Freedom to want what you want to want. Or as he says more precisely, it means that uh, a person is free to will what he wants to will or to have the will that he wants. In other words, to have the desire be effective that his volition picked out. That's why the unwilling addict doesn't have it, because uh, his will, the, the thing that actually was effective, is the desire to take the drug. And that's the one that actually succeeds, and he does take the drug, and it's not the one he wanted. 
the unwilling addict's will is not free because he doesn't uh, have the will, the effective first order desire that he wants. Now, this account of freedom of the will has some advantages, as he says at the end. Um, so the advantages are in, uh, where, where does he list the advantages? Um, yes, on page 17. It says, my the in the beginning of section 4, my theory concerning the freedom of the will accounts easily for uh, our disinclination to allow that this freedom is joined by members of any species inferior to our own. So the first advantage of this account is that it explains why humans, most humans, the humans that are not wantons, uh, have it and most animals don't. They don't. Most animals don't have second-order volitions. Most humans do. So that's one advantage of his, uh, his account. Number two is it also satisfies another condition that must be met by any theory of freedom of the will by making it apparent why the freedom of the will should be regarded as desirable. So we think that it's important. What, you know, why is it that the unwilling addict we actually think is a we would choose to be the unwilling addict rather than being the wanton addict. Even though the wanton addict seems more content, he doesn't have this internal conflict. Why do we want to be this one? Because we think having free will is valuable. There's something good about it. Okay, so a theory of free will has to explain what is it that's valuable about free will. And he says, my theory does that. It says it's valuable because when you are free, you're having second-order desires satisfied. That's what it is to act freely, is to have your second-order desire satisfied. And everybody knows that having a desire satisfied is good, right? That's simple and obvious. Uh, you know, I want that donut, I get that donut. My desire is satisfied. You know, that's a good thing. And he says, well, second-order desires are, if anything, more important. So, uh, you, when you act free, when you have freedom of the will, your second order desires are satisfied. That's even better than having your first order desires. So that's another advantage of his theory. Now he does concede that there are complexities that might that his theory um, uh, raises, and these he starts talking about these on page fifteen and sixteen. He says, if at uh, the bottom of page 15, if there is unresolved conflict among someone's second-order desires, like, I want to want that, but I also don't want to want that. You have two conflict, just as you can have conflicting first-order desires, like the desire to eat a donut and the, the desire to diet, uh, you can have conflicting second-order desires. If you have conflict in your second-order desires, then as he puts it, he, the, the agent, is in danger of having no second-order volition. For unless this conflict is resolved, he has no preference concerning which of his first-order desires. If you both desire to, uh, that your desire to work be your will, and you also desire that your desire to play be your will, then there isn't a single volition. And if you don't have a single clear volition, you don't have freedom of the will. So that's another way to fail to be free. Now, there's also, uh, and this is the main criticism that other people have of, uh, of Frankfurt's theory, once you've introduced the idea of a second-order desire, a desire about the first order, that opens the door to a sort of infinite regress, because there could be third-order desires. You could say, I want to want to want not to take that drug, <coughs> and then wouldn't the third order desires be more important than the second order because they're desires about, and wouldn't that make you more of a person? And then, well, what about fourth order desires? And if you have, a, have a, a, uh, like an infinite regress, then nothing ever happens and we don't know what's valuable and, uh, and you don't get freedom. So that whole opening of regress is a problem. And he, he says something about that on pages 16 and 17. See if you think how convincing that is. Now, a couple of other things about his account. He says, some people are lucky 
and it's just easy for them for their volition to be satisfied. He says, um, the conformity of a person's will to his higher order volitions may be far more thoughtless and spontaneous than, you know, in cases like this. Some people are naturally moved by kindness when they want to be kind. So in other words, they, uh, they have a volition that they want to want to be kind, and their kindness, their desire to be kind makes, uh, you know, wins out. This is familiar. There are, um, there, this is a debate in philosophy. Should acting morally be difficult? In some, uh, on the one hand, people say, yes, it should, because the reason why we value morality is because it's a struggle. It's like winning out. Compare it with being brave. If you don't feel fear, then you're not really brave. You know, a robot, a bomb diffusing robot is not brave in diffusing a bomb because it doesn't feel fear. Whereas a human diffusing a bomb who's terrified, they're brave because they're overcoming their fear. By analogy, you have to find at doing the right thing hard for your moral action to be worthwhile, for it to be truly moral. So say some theorists. But against that, um, look at the idea of a moral saint. A moral saint is somebody who never, the idea of doing wrong never occurs to them. They just want to do the right thing and they always do it and they are happy to do it and they find it easy. Isn't that a possibility? Well, um, Frankfurt is saying, sure, some people are just constructed, they're the lucky ones, that their volitions and their will um, coincide. Uh, and he says, the enjoyment of freedom comes easily to some, the, those kind of people, it, others must struggle to achieve it, like the unwilling un, uh, addict. Uh, okay, final uh, points. What have, have we talked about everything? Oh, yes. Um, now, we get to... Uh, a very key point, talking about moral responsibility. Um, he says, it is generally supposed that in addition to satisfying the two conditions I have mentioned, the two advantages, a satisfactory theory of the freedom of the will necessarily provides an analysis of one of the conditions of moral responsibility. This is on page 18. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, reading this, Frankfurt got a bit confusing. And I think the problem is he uses the term freedom of the will and uh, will to be free. And he uses them uh, differently. So he says, uh, let's just read the passage um, passage that he says. First of all, he says, freedom is separate. He says, uh, this is on page 18. It is generally supposed that in a, uh, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, the most common recent approach to the problem of understanding the freedom of the will has been indeed to inquire what is entailed by the assumption that someone is morally responsible. So in other words, in order to work out what freedom of the will is, people say, well, we know what it is to be morally responsible, and you can only be morally responsible if you're free. So by looking at cases where we hold people morally responsible, that'll tell us what freedom of the will is. And Frankfurt says that's wrong. In my view, however, the relation between moral responsibility and the freedom of the will has been very widely misunderstood. It is not true that a person is morally responsible for what is done only if his will was free when he did it. Now, you might think when he says will was free, that he's talking about his account of freedom of the will. I, it doesn't seem to be the case that he's doing that here, because he says, uh, a person's will is free only if he is free to have the will he wants. Okay, that sounds a bit like, because um, when you're in the free, when you do have freedom of the will in his account, it's when you, uh, your volition the, the first order desire that your volition wants to be your will actually is your will. But um, here he introduces this idea of could have done otherwise. 
He says that this means that with regard to any of his first order desires, he is free either to make that desire his will or to make some other first order desire his will instead. In other words, he's saying what uh, most people talk about when they say a person's will is free is that um, your volition is free. You could have had a different volition. And he says that's something over and above what he calls freedom of the will. So what he calls freedom of the will, as he says right at the end, is entirely compatible with determinism. You know, it, you could be determined to have your second order desire that I want to, uh, my desire to refrain from eating the donut. You were determined to have a second order desire that that first order desire uh, went out, and it did. That's entirely consistent with determinism. That's why he's a compatibilist. You could have that, that. And you can be morally responsible if that happens. But what you might lack is the uh, kind of thing that a libertarian demands, that you could have done otherwise, that you could have had a different volition. You could have had a different volition. He says, I don't care about that. I don't care if you could have had a different volition. And in fact, um, so this, this ties back to the, what I was talking about, the Mr. Black example, where, uh, where you kill Mr. Pink, and even though you couldn't have done otherwise, you're morally responsible. And he gives uh, another example of a willing addict. This is like the Mr. Black case. The willing addict is someone who wants to his desire to take a drug to win out. So he wants to want the drug and he wants his desire for the drug to be successful. Now it turns out that if he wanted otherwise, he would still have been like, he would still have taken the drug. So he's taking the drug, whatever happens. Suppose he, uh, if he, he's just like the unwilling addict. In other words, the unwilling addict ends up taking the drug even though he doesn't want it, except that he wants it. But if he didn't want it, he'd be the unwilling addict because whatever happens, he's taking the drug. The, the first order desire to take the drug is so powerful that it doesn't ca matter what his second order desires are, it's going to win. It just so happens that his second order desires agree. Now, could he have done otherwise? No, he's, he couldn't have done otherwise than what he does, than taking the drug. But despite the fact that he couldn't have done otherwise, he is morally responsible. So, what Frankfurt is saying is, when people talk about this uh, freedom of the will, uh, when, when other people talk about, um, how does he put it, acting out of, uh, acting out of, well, uh, at the end of page 18 where he says, a person's will is free. When other people talk about a person's will being free, they mean something different from what I mean by freedom of the will. They mean something on top of that, that they could have had a different volition. Or that, they, that if they'd wanted, if their volition had been that another desire went out, then that desire would have won out. But that, of course, isn't satisfied here, because if the willing addict actually had a volition that he not take the drug, then he would have failed because he's going to take the drug. So he doesn't meet this criterion of he could have done otherwise. He's always going to take the drug because his, his addiction is so strong. Y yet, says um, Frankfurt, he is morally responsible. We can blame him for taking the drug because he had a volition to take the drug. We don't blame the unwilling addict for taking the drug because his volition was not to take the drug. We should assess them according to their volitions, uh, according to their will, not their action. Um, and the will of the willing addict is to take the drug so we can hold him responsible because he was doing what he, what he wanted to want to do. Um, so that's his discussion at the end. Moral responsibility, therefore, doesn't require that you could have done otherwise because freedom of, uh, so what, to, in, to summarize, Harry Frankfurt 
is a compatibilist, but he's a more sophisticated compatibilist than classic compatibilists like Locke, Hume, even John Stuart Mill. These are all compatibilists who say that you are, the freedom that matters is freedom of action. In response, libertarians say, no, that's not good enough, um, because freedom of action is something that animals have. And what uh, Frankfurt does, he says, you're right. Freedom of action is not enough. I'm going to give you a notion of freedom of the will, though, that unlike libertarians doesn't involve this weird, undetermined will, whatever it is that Kant is talking about. It's a perfectly down-to-earth notion where will is a desire. We understand how actions are caused by desires. We just introduce this notion of second order, and this idea of second order explains what's va what is valuable about a person. Uh, persons are potentially moral agents who, who can be held, who can act freely or fail to act freely. The wanton addict fails to act freely kind of because he's incapable of it. The unwilling addict fails to un, uh, act freely because in this one instance his desires overrode him, but he has this ability to have second order volitions. That means in some cases he will be able to act freely. The wanton addict, addict just can't have this freedom of the will because it requires having volitions. So, what Frankfurt has done here is come up with a more sophisticated notion, a notion of freedom of the will that is nonetheless entirely compatible with determinism. It's a modern compatibilism that goes one step beyond classic compatibilism uh, and avoids some of the criticisms of classic compatibilism that libertarians and hard determinists have come up with. There you go.